talk about uh, either three or four subjects, depending on how far we get. We're going to first cover diseases and pests, which I will not cover in detail as much detail as in the slides, because more than likely in your first year you will probably, most of you will not see any of these diseases. And I'll point out the ones most likely that you will see. And uh, the, the best thing is when you start, if you start noticing diseases, get on, the, on our uh, Yahoo group or the, uh, the Facebook page and start asking questions. Uh, call, uh, call Stephanie and get, get a hold of a beekeeper that has seen that before uh, to try and help you out. Uh, then we've got uh, summer management, fall management, and if we have time, we will try and discuss kind of a plan where you might, what you might do about diseases for this first year. Uh, some people don't like to uh, put any chemicals in their hives. Some people like to put chemicals to prevent anything from happening. So somewhere along that spectrum, you will find yourself. Let's see. First, first a couple of announcements before we get that is we do have a hands-on class coming up. And I, we've mentioned that several times, but it's the first class 1.0 is on April 11th. And the way that works is we there's spots for 48 students, and depending on how many we get, we'll probably run through in batches of 10 at different stations. And to get you familiar with, well, how do you how do you put on your veil? How do you use a smoker? How do you use a hive tool? How do you open a hive? And then go over and open a hive. And then go through it with your first inspection. Really valuable to do it before you get your own bees. Especially with somebody experienced there helping you along. Uh, the next hands-on class, we do exactly the same thing, but we do it two weeks later. Uh, because after, I think it's two weeks later. So that's a week after you've had your bees. You're either you already opened them once, looked at them, or you're getting ready to open them. And this just gives you another opportunity to get into a class and, and do it on somebody else's bees before you're on. Uh, and what we do with the money is all of our our assistants and helpers are are uh, work for free. The, the twenty bucks help us to pay for our ATR. We'll uh, we'll be able to populate it for other classes. Uh, the other two classes later on in the year is the the Northwest uh, beekeeping class. It's in scope. It's similar to this one. But it's much more intense because you now you've got uh, two months of beekeeping knowledge to build on. So we hit some of the same topics, but we're talking more about why rather than what. Here we talk a lot about what, but not why because we don't have time. Uh, that class is a mix of half in, half lectures and half in the apiary with hands on, and lunch is provided. And then two weeks after that, we have our queen rearing class. And in, in years past, we've had a two-day, very extensive class. This year, we're bringing it back to one day, and we're focusing this mo mostly on people with two hives, so they can actually go home and grow queens. If they want to make a split from their hive package, that's, if it's big enough, if it's thin enough, they can go home, grow queen, and create another hive. And that's our. So both of those are really valuable. The first, uh, the beekeeping in the Northwest, we, we, you get one of these books, which is Hive Inspection Basics for the Northwest Beekeepers. And it is much better than the state-provided one that's in this class, because it's got pictures, lots of pictures. And I'll hand this one around to show around. And in the Queen Rearing class, we put we give everybody one of these queen rearing essentials. I'll pass that around. Could we buy the books separately? Yeah, I don't know if Stedman's has either one of these, but they're both available out on the web. On okay, diseases and pests. Uh, for a lot of you, these slides are going to be pretty ugly. 
but they, the slide is trying to cover what the life cycle is of the pest or disease, how to identify it, how do you prevent it, and some sort of treatment and control for it. Um, at, at this level, we'll try and identify what the pest is and your likelihood of, of getting it. And some of the more important ones we'll cover, cover in more detail. But already, oh, oh what's the biggest pest? Oh, oh, what's the two biggest pests in your apiary? Mites. Mites. I'll say the row mite is number one. What's the second one? I would say it was you. <laughs> Every time you open your hive, you can kill bees. You can misdiagnose and treat with the wrong thing. You can actually do more damage to it <coughs> by treating with one thing that is slightly damaging to the bees but misses the actual pest. So, so being uninformed or misknowledgeable or not actually inspecting your hive, looking for stuff, you can become the biggest pest in here. Okay. So hopefully these, these classes are helping you to not be that big pest. Oh, let's see. But usually most, most pests are targeted, they're, they're, they're attacking the brood. That's, that's most of them. Some are attacking the adult. Some, like the mite, attacks both. And let's see. Key here, let's see, don't be a pest. The first one, American foul brood. Up until the varroa mite, this was the worst disease in bees. And it is still uh, what what happens with mites is the mites get in, they kill your bees, and you can repopulate with more bees. The, the American foul brood gets in there. Yes, it kills brood. Uh, but it also contaminates your equipment. The way it works is it's a very small, it's a uh, spore forming bacteria that is in nature. Now, I haven't found where in nature, but somehow the bees find it. And the bees pick it up when they're either picking up nectar or pollen, and they bring it back to the hive and they feed it to the young larva. If the young larva gets it in high enough percentage, then that larva will become the the spores will actually germinate in the in the lining of the of the bee gut of the larva, and and it will actually grow and consume the entire larva. And what it looks like, let's see, let's see. So so it consumes the larva, and it it attacks the larva. Let's see, we've got some more pictures. Here's some ugly pictures of it. But it, it turns the, the larva into a brown piece of goop. It kind of melts down, consumes it from the inside, and it, it kills the larva when the larva is, is older. And so what happens is the, bee, the larva gets infected, the bees cap it over, and it melts down inside. Then starts to rot, and the capping start getting holes in them from the from the smell and the rancid smell in there, and the bees start picking out because the, the bees didn't uh, the bees did not uh, detect that the larva was dead, and so at, at an older stage, that in, that young larva that turns into this uh, goop that kind of melts down, sticks to the bottom of the cell, and then it, and it, it turns itself into spores germinates and these spores, the whole body of the, of the larva turns into spores. Millions and millions of spores. Then the bees will try and pick that out, but they can't get it all out. When they're picking it out, they're getting it down in the mouth parts, and they feed it to other larvae, and it continues the cycle. So this one, when it affects, there's, you got to detect it, and here's some you want to see. Here's when you're looking in a cell, which is hard to see, but that's the tongue sticking up of the larva that was dry. Uh, there's some techniques to look at it. Is if you see this, if it, it smells really bad, 
And if you see the dead carcasses, if you are inspecting and you've actually spotted early enough, you'll only see a few cells of this. And if you put, take like a matchstick, stick it in and stir it up and you pull it out, it'll be like this brown ropey goop that comes off of the stick. And, yeah. yeah. So this smells really bad. Is there anything else that will make your hide smell bad? Uh, this one is a real rancid, really, any rotting brood will make it smell bad. After a hive dies, and there's brood in there or old bees, they will start to stink over the water. But while a hive is, is actively with bees going in and out of it, this can make it smell bad. Uh, in, in this, the, the key is to stop that reinfection, so once a hive gets this, uh, the recommendation is you kill all the bees and you burn the hive. Uh, some people will take the uh, another method is to shake all the bees out onto brand new equipment, burn the old equipment, and then uh, treat the treat the new bees in new equipment and then wash them to make sure that it doesn't it doesn't uh, reinfect. There's there's several processes out there that, to try and keep that new equipment from reinfecting. Typically. Typically, if you wait and you catch it later, the colony is so small it's not worth saving anyone. Anyway. You're better off to close it up and kill them and destroy it. Uh, fortunately, of everybody in here, there may be one person that has this show up in their apiary from a new package. I think in the last five years I've seen one person get it from a new package. And we don't know whether it came in the package or whether it came from the area around them. So it's pretty rare when it occurs, but when it occurs, it's really bad. And here's more pictures of it. It's, it's kind of tough to spot because when you're looking in cells, you need actually really good light to see the, see the spores. So in this one, if you suspect something bad is going on, you see this, uh, you see this ugly looking uh, surface structure that's got holes in it. It's either mites, or it's, or it's a, a brood disease that's killing brood in it. Uh, so it's discolored larva around the black scale. And let's see. So we'll go on. Here's the rope test. There's also a some sort of a kit that you can take it that's got a milk test in it that you can take out the stage of shake it in the roll that they tell you and whether it clears up it's, it's a positive test. Prevention. It, it, and in, in this one, I think it's better off not to do any prevention. There's a term, treatments treatments that used to be used for prevention, but then the, they said that the doctor started to be resistant to it, so people stopped doing it. You can just get rid of it once you have it. And it will spread rapidly. If you, if you get it in one hive and eight you need to clean up as quickly as possible, otherwise it will spread all the rest of the hive. So as that hive gets weak and the other hives start robbing it out of any resources, they can pull out those, those spores and move them to the other hive. Uh, and the typical two products used if you're into the chemicals is teramycin and hyla. And there's lots of directions for you. Uh, next, next one that's similar but not as bad. It's called European powder. And this one is a uh, bacterium. It does not form spores. Uh, but this one, the uh, it affects the larva, but at a younger stage. So the way this one looks is it affects young larva before they get hatched. And what happens is, rather than the larva being curly white and looking full in the cell, it will tend to shrink and twist in the cell. Let's see what we have. Here's some pictures. There's a normal larva as it's getting bigger, but a bad or one that's infected will tend to turn a darker brown, sometimes dark. Typically, I'll see them, they're, they're kind of twisted. Here's a, here's a good picture of a real one. And, and they die before they're capped over. So you'll see those in open cells. You won't have to remove a capped cell to see it. 
Uh, I've seen, in the past 20 years, I've only seen this a couple of years ago, it started showing up. And I believe it's another disease that's showing up because of the mites. The bees are working, combating viruses and other things. They don't have time to clean up all of the, all of the maladies in, in the hive. So European Albert is starting to get a little hold and you might see some more of that showing up. Uh, I've seen that in, about two years ago I've seen it. Prior to that I have not seen it at all in this area. But it is around that. And a normal brood patch is this is all solid, it's all light brown, pretty, but when you start getting looking in the cells and you're seeing little twisted larvas in there, uh, some of them will look dried and desiccated, and some will just look that, kind of like that twisty, twisted brown. Uh, and, and this is one of the side effects of mites. Uh, there is, and, and if you do the, if you think it's American Falbert, you can do that roping test and it doesn't spring out like the Falbert, like the American Falbert. And it smells sour. It's not rancid, but it's more of a sour smell. And there's nothing actually registered to treat it, but if you treat with teramycin, it fixes it. Saccharin. It's another one I've never seen until last year. I saw a couple, a couple bits of it. It is. It's caused by a virus. One of the 18 viruses, or I think we're now up to 25 viruses that they've identified that are following in the wake of the of the uh, herbal mite. Uh, and how it works is it it turns brown. And if you're able to grab it with tweezers or a high tool or something, it comes out and it's like a, a soggy bag, which is not normal. And it looks, well, let's see, here's, here's typically what you'll see. Usually it's brown, it's more brown. And sometimes if you see it later, it's, it's getting dried up. So it's, whether you're seeing this or European powder, you can, they kind of look similar. So, but until you pull them out, you won't really know. Uh, this one, there's no treatment. Uh, typically, the recommendation on this one is you replace your queen. For almost all of these, the, the recommendation you will see in most books, magazines, websites, will say replace the queen. And the reason they all say that is that the... the yeah, all hives have the ability to fight off their natural enemies. They will have certain genetics that will go clean the hive and get rid of certain things. Some that will pull out dead larvae. Uh, some that might actually chew on the mites and get rid of them. But it's all about the genetic makeup of the bees in the colony. And, you know, and we all know that the queen goes off and mates with a bunch of drones. And so the, the colony is made up of that queen mother's genetics plus all of the genetics of the drones that she made it with. And it's, and it's, when you get a specific hive, it's, Eric, the thought is that that queen made it with a bunch of drones and none of those drones nor her had a good ability to clean up whatever disease is attacking that hive. So what you're doing is, you, is they say, well, the genetic makeup of the hive is not such that it will fix that whatever problem it is. And so the solution is replace the queen and you're hoping that the, the offspring of your new queen will have a bit better genetic makeup and will be able, will be able to uh, combat whatever this queen's offspring can, can't take care of. The, the, that's why, and, and that's the recommendation for almost everything. All of these, the viruses and all the other ones. Uh, chop root. That's another one common. We see it here about once every five years. It's cyclical depending upon our cold wet springs. 
It's when it's damp in the hive, it's a fungus that gets into the larva and it actually consumes the larva and it turns it into like a, a white piece of chalk. Hence we call it chocolate. Uh, the bees can clean it up, but if it's cool, the bees won't clean it up fast enough to get rid of it. So one of the solutions is replace the queen because they don't know how. The other thing is if you can get populations, if you can condense the hive, get the heat up in the hive, then they have a better chance of, of staying ahead of it. Uh, the other thing is that when this stuff it, it consumes the larva, turns it into white chalk, and then it actually uh, blooms. And when it blooms, the end of it turns black. So you can see it's, it's blooming and spread itself when it starts to turn black. This a lot of times will show up on the on the bottom board of hives right in front. Uh, I looked over in the apiary this afternoon and I saw one one chopper body that was laid out in one, which is not bad. Uh, sometimes you'll see 20 or 30 if, if there's a heavy infestation. Uh, again, there's nothing registered generally to replace the clean or get it out of its wet, cool climate. Nozema used to be a not much of a problem. There's, there's two forms of Nozema. There's a Nozema apis and a Nozema serrana. Nozema apis used to get us in the uh, spring. And it would slow the bees down. We would generally see dysentery show up in the hive. We would buy a magic bullet, uh, human deal bee, treat it, the problem would go away. Or we would treat it, and the weather would get better, and it would go away. Or we would feed the hive, and it would get better, and it would go away. The, and, and that still works if you have Nozema apis, but I don't think we're finding Nozema apis in wherever they're testing it now. They're almost exclusively finding Nosema serrana. And it's another form of it that was transferred over from the serrana. And it looks different under a microscope. The shape of the little dots look differently. Um, what, what this stuff does is it gets in the bee's gut and it drills into the bee's lining and reproduces consumes the food that the bee would normally get. So the bees are actually malnourished. That's what the damage is doing to the bees here. Uh, so this one shortens their life. So if you have a hive that is sluggish, doesn't expand how long, and it could be that the bees are dying off early because of they have no symptoms. This one actually has no other symptoms. Get to find out what you have, if you take a sample of bees and you send it off to a testing lab, a WS2 is a great spot to do that because it's a little free. And then they will, they will test and send the sample. Then send any your answers back to whether it's there. Uh, and, and this one, what they're finding out is if you have Nozema serrana in a heavy mite load invested bees that have lots of viruses, those bees die out very quickly. If you have only Nozema serrana, and no mite problems or other virus problems, the bees can generally outflow these. And here it is, not easily observed. Uh, dysentery. Uh, dysentery <coughs> is not a disease of bees, it's a condition of bees. Uh, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of something, generally there's something wrong in the bee's gut. They, they either can't, they've been in, they can't get off and fly and, and defecate out in the air, or there's something in their gut irritating their lining. Um, when it shows up, you'll end up with brown streaks on the outside of their hive. A severe infestation, you, you a, a severe case, you open up the hive and it's brown all over the frames. Usually you're finding that when the hive's dead in the spring and you say, what killed this one? And that was, I don't know, they had dysentery at some point. So, 
usually it's a it's a cold winter or the, the hive was in a wet area. And here's the, the magic bullet that used to work. Typically what what uh, if you can feed feed the colony and get them a warmer area, they generally do better. B paralysis is one of the viruses that follow the, the mite. And it's easy to spot because a normal bee is like uh, brown abdomen or yellow and black stripes. When this one hits, you'll see bees that are all black. And that's this bee paralysis. Hair with black. You can't see the virus, but you can tell it with the black. Uh, let's see, here's, here's more distance here. Oh, here's a severe dysentery. If you're in snow, they go out and use the bathroom and everybody the snow's all brown. And usually that will happen because the bees will think it's bright and sunny out because of the reflection of the snow, so it'll all fly out there. And then hit the cold air and die and land in the snow. Uh, let's see. Wax moth. It, you read a lot about wax moth, but it's not. It, it, they don't really go after the hive when the hive is populated. What they go after is the comb. They go after the casings that are left over in the brood area from the larva here, from the larva. So if you have if you have a hive that dies, the wax moth will go in and lay its eggs and the larva will hatch out and the larva will go into that brood area and will eat those little cocoons destroying all the wax along with it. Uh, when most people were using wax foundation, they would store this stuff up and the wax moth would get in there and you would just, the wax moth would just have go throughout that thing. And if, if severe enough, I'd seen some boxes where you could not get you could not pull the frames out of the box. It was it was a box with ten frames, and it was solid webbing that was attached across everything. You you could you, the only way to get it out was to beat it out with a hammer and rip it out so it was all attached together. Uh, with the wax or the plastic foundation, that's a barrier. So the wax moth larva, when it crawls around, it's limited to where it can go. And so generally you'll see them clear off one side or the other side as, as it goes. It won't expand out and take out the whole box and make it impossible. Uh, there's a big greater one and a lesser one. I've seen more of the lesser ones here. I used to see the greater ones. The greater ones, their cocoons are pretty big and they will actually chew away pieces of, of the wood and the frame. But the lesser moth doesn't. And they're just consuming the wax and whatever's next to it than the, uh, than the cocoons. Uh, this is the biggest problem comes in when you're storing honey super. If you take honey supers and store them through the winter, uh, you don't want wax moth to get in there and destroy it. So there's there's a uh, there's a chemical you can put in or you can sort of trap the mite because you don't want to store frames with that's had a brood in it because that's what the moth wants. Store those separately from the, the frames that have only had honey because they'll go after the, the ones. So you can actually you can actually trap crop them. You can you can put up put your stacks of pure supers and then put another put a separator and put a box that the mice will that they'll go in that has those cocoons in them. You can actually go in and, and trap the wax moth that way. And then one way to get rid of the max wax moth is you take it and put it in the freezer for a couple days. Or, and, and that's that's kind of what it looks like. This is just a big fuzzy mess. Or that's a pretty severe infestation of a large wax moth. Or you can buy the paradiporobenzene moth crystals and put in just the moth that they'll kill me. But you, before you use, you can use that stuff, but uh, 
before you put them on your hives, you got to air them out. Because the bees are not too good for bees either. What, what I have always done is I just store my honey supers in an open area, in a light area. Because the wax moth is looking for a dark, enclosed little corner to go in. So I'll put my honey supers in an open area and I'll actually cross them so they block the air gaps in the open area. And then I'll give them this other luxurious foam comb to go into and then I'll inspect that every month and throw it in the freezer. Okay. Uh, small high beetle, we don't have them, fortunately, and that's what they are. They're about one third the size of a bee, and hopefully they will stay away. They're still down stuff. We don't know whether they would survive our winters here with all the wet or not. Because they go in and make a mess of the hive, and then they go out and dig their dig in the ground and, and survive over the winter and come back in in the spring. And in areas where they're invested, People open up hives and, and they just fly out of it. And they make a big mess. You'll see goot running out of the front of the hive because they'll go in there and, and tunnel through the, the, honey, the honey supers and the honey will just kind of like flow out onto the ground. Big mess, we don't want it here. And there's controls. Uh, here we do have yellow jackets and some earwigs. Earwigs are not a problem. Yellow jackets are typically a problem for small hives. They have something called uh, entrance guards or entrance, little screened entrances that you can, can get to. So the bees figure out a way to go out, but the yellow jacket can't figure out a way to go in. They're fairly simple. Uh, you generally don't need them unless you're, you have a very small hive. Most large colonies will fend off the yellow jackets. Uh, ants, uh, if you have a large ant nest right next to your colony, they can go in and you, they're generally attractive when they start feeding their sugar water. If we spill it all over, the ants will go in and move it. So what I've done for ant nests is I've moved the ant nest, just dig them up and move them. Uh, I've tried burning, but it's easier to move them than to burn them. Uh, I've tried uh, cinnamon around the, the, the colony will keep the, the bees or the uh, ants at bay. Cinnamon works really well until the rain hits. You got to refresh it. Uh, the little sugar ants will get into the top above the inner cover, and those I just, just scrape them off and knock them on the ground. They're not generally not a big problem. The big problem is the great big mounds of, of ants that you look at them and they're just like marching in like an army. Yeah. What? Is that earwigs? No, earwigs are just looking for a place to go, uh, and they like the moisture. Generally, they like the little moisture that builds up around the, the outside. If you have any colonies, the, the top bars or the war hives with windows, every time you open a window, there will be earwigs all over there. They don't seem to be a problem. So they cohabitate. Yep. Yeah. Are those the what the, they kind of snap? Yeah, they'll have little pictures that out front. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Mice. Uh, I have my my hives up on 16 inches, and once I move them up, I haven't had a problem. I I don't know why. But the mice don't seem to get up into my eyes once I raise them up off the ground a little bit more. When I have them down about four inches, there are mice in there every year. So uh, it's been recommended by standards for six inches. So yeah. Is that but it depends on how many mice are running around in the field where you're putting. Right. It's all about location. But I have six cats, or I had six cats. So what about, what about rats? I haven't had a rat get into my beehives. I've had them go into storage stuff, and they make a mess, and they can chew holes. When I used to have a, a wax foundation, the mice were horrible problems. They would go in there and they would chew a big one, a big nest in there, and they would they would chew through the wax, and it would you'd open up the box, it looked like a normal box, you pull it out, and there's a great big nest in there, and it, it destroyed all the wax. George, you got a question back here. Yeah. Wouldn't the bees sting the mice to death, though? 
Or is this I've like in the seen, winter I've after? Seen, the... I've seen, usually the, the mice will go into the bottom of the colony, and usually in the winter the colony moves up. So the bees are just getting in there down below, and they cohabitate for a while. Really? Yeah. Because I, I I've, I've seen pictures where a mice, mouse has gotten in, and the bees actually cornered it, and they end up propolizing it in yeah. the corner. Huh. I've, I've read about there, that. There are pictures of that, yeah. but I've never seen it. And also, are, are raccoons any uh, No. Threat? I've never seen a raccoon problem. I've heard of skunks being a problem. In, in my yard, I've never seen it, but skunks apparently can learn how to go scrape on the front of the hive, and the bees come out, and they eat them, and they scrape on some more. <laughs> but, but I've never seen it at my house. I have trapped two skunks there. Uh, bears. If you have bears, you, bears are a big pest. Bees have a natural defense against bears. They put their hives up in trees, about 10 to 15 feet high. But we don't like to climb trees to treat our, to, to care for our hives. So we put them down on the ground for right easy reach of bears. Uh, if you have a bear problem, uh, generally electric fences are about the only way you can keep the bears out. Uh, if you don't have a bear problem, you don't need to mess with electric fence. So if you want to roll, roll the dice. I, down in South Kitsap, I have had bees for 20 years, and last fall was my first bear at my property. It took out uh, three colonies. But up until that point, I've never had a bear problem there. I live on Wicks Lake Road, which is on Lake Helena. So again, and the people around my area the last few years have been hit by beer. Uh, across the freeway on the other side over in Alala, we hear a lot of blood about bears over there. Not oh, great. <laughs> because there's some really nice drainages that the bears run up and down. Uh, Birds, I've, I've actually seen birds from an observation hive in my living room. I've seen bees fly out and birds grab them. So they don't, generally don't grab very many. It's kind of neat to watch. But, but birds generally are not much of a problem. There's still the idea of putting something on top of your hive for wind or something to keep it from blowing the top off, right? Right. If you're uh, in my location, I don't have any wind really. I've got some little trees around that talk about that. Diseases. More questions on diseases? The rashes around the down. I, I never see that for moving. I, I've, we, had, we had one old guy that, that came to our meeting and he had a problem with, an ongoing problem with a bear. So what he did is he actually took chain link and wrapped around this this hive and then set up and and he because he tried some electric fence and the fence chased off the bear but the bear came back and so he wrapped it in chain link and he took down his fence and he said well if the bear wants it now he's gonna have a tough time getting in. He said it, it was about three hundred yards away. He found that colony still intact but that bear had, had drug it a long way to so, so bears can get, yeah. I, I, there was another guy that went up in the mountains, brought his bees back. A bear came and he brought him back uh, at night. And a bear got into his trailer and ripped open every hive and got into his truck and ripped open every hive. And so he had to go to work the next day. So he quickly put them back together and worked all day and came back and, and he didn't have a chance to go again with them. So he left them for another day. The bear came back the next night and threw them all out of the gas can. So, bears can be a real thing. What causes the foul brood, the European foul brood, to spread? Uh, most of it is uh, transferred by the bees in their food. It's usually the bacteria, or in, in that case, bacteria, but in the other, the spores or more fungus that's in their food. And that's in it. And that's in it. Jerry ran over.
Jerry, your turn. Exactly. Hi, everybody. You didn't turn on yet. We're going to have fun now. So, you, didn't uh, you didn't turn on, Jerry. Pardon me? You didn't turn on. Oh, no, I didn't. Do I, I got to do it. Okay, so I got to go through the steps. Of this. All right. Am I on? You're on. You're on. You're on. Let me turn this thing down. There you go. Don't drive me out here. All right. Is that okay? Is good? All right. So who had a chance to go to the apiary tonight or today? About 10 people? Yeah? Got some hands on? Got to pet some bees? Got to name them? Talk to them? It was the first time? Who was the, uh, who was the first time for everybody at the apiary? Yeah? Was it what you expected? Oh, yeah? Did they get you all prepared for your own beehive? Yeah. No? No? Why? Did you get stung? No. Did you have a bad experience? No. <coughs> it's not ready. The more you learn, the more you're like, holy crap. Oh. <laughs> I know that feeling. I've been saying that for a long time. I would I ever get myself into. And uh, so, who has beehives in this room? Had or have? You have some still? You do not. How many times have you tried and didn't have beehives? This is last year's first year. First year, okay. And you have beehives still? You have one. So now you're learning anything in this class yet? About what you may need to do differently? Okay, good. Well, you've done okay, though. You've had them for a year, right? Or the bees have done okay with you. They haven't fired you yet. That's good. Well, that's who's got beehives. You have a... I have a couple, yeah. You have a couple. Right. But I lost right. well, one swarm, one demise, over the, over the time. But I still oh. have two left. You're supposed to do all those things. All right, so I'm covering summer high You know you know what? I'm second back here about what I was going to talk about. So I want to share with everybody why they do bees. Because, uh, and just so I often get asked. I was selling honey. I sell honeys on Sundays. I have a little place I sell, I sell a lot of my honey. I'm in the business for honey. Um, actually, two of these I'm in the business for honey and therapy. My work is very stressful. I was hoping to make the apiary today. I couldn't make it because at the last minute, one of my guys came in, I managed this shop, and said I was supposed to do something I told him yesterday. This thing is right. Turn, turn it down a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I don't want to hear myself. Um, so one of my guys, is that okay? Can you guys hear that? Still? Yeah. Okay? Can you hear back there? Good. So one of my uh, guys said to me today, I, was, I promised him something yesterday, I forgot. And, uh, end of the month, I still, so I got a lot of things going on. So um, I do bees for honey. I'm in the business for honey. Um, and I do the honey to pay for all the therapy I get for my bees. And uh, I do bees for therapy to get away from my work and the insanity of being a human. Um, and, I, and I love bees. So I, I just got stuck with bees years ago, and I love bees. And I tell people they ask, and I sell my honey, and it's rewarding when I sell my honey, and people love my honey. Uh, customers come back, it's organic honey, it's raw honey, it's got all kinds of things floating in it. Bee particles and eyeballs and that, and just love that stuff. <laughs> I'm from allergies and that. I felt it too. We're gonna get into that because I'm gonna cover I'm gonna cover summer high management, and then I'm gonna move into honey production. And I'm all about honey production. I last year I did about uh, 400 gallons of honey, and I expect this year to double, do that much or double. Honey, of course, beekeeping is agriculture, and I always ask people always ask me like, well, how much honey do you expect to make this year? I said, well, I don't know. Depends on the climate, the bees, the weather, the flowers, all those things. It's like growing an acre a week. And somebody said, well, how much do you expect to get off your acre a week? Well, I expect to get 25 bushels, but if it rains hard, I'll lose them. We don't get any at all. So we keep the same way. So I'm going to cover hive management, summer hive management. Some of the things I do, and, I, and I'm going to cover the stuff here on these screens here, and some of the stuff that I do that I've learned from experience that worked for me. And hopefully in this class of all the different instructors, you're going to learn a lot of different things that you're going to try, depending on where you live at, it may be different and works better for you, something different. 
And that's why everybody, and George has encouraged everybody to reading books and that, because people all around the area try different things. Certain different things work for different people. Um, so we'll start with summer high bed and honey production colonies. They add boxes, frames, bars for honey storage as needed. And I guess I was just studying the test, so I was told that I had to make sure I, I told my memorizing test. So some of the things that will be on the test, I'll try to point out. Um, remove excess cap frames of honey. Inspect weak honeys. Keep high from swarming honey collection is the goal. Then we'll move down to summer hive management for non-honey production. For non-honey. Okay, so I see this. So we've got honey production, and we've got the non-honey production. So go on vacation, control excess population of small nucleus colonies, set them free and rearing hive conditions in the hive, create splits for hive number expansions, move colonies to pollination or later, nectar flows, dismantle hives for clean propagation, feed starving <coughs> bees, practice beekeeping techniques, sell excess hives. So does everybody understand those two categories? Who's in here who wants to make honey for themselves? Who wants, first of all, first of all, how many people are going to actually get bees that are all set up before June? You want your bees before June, right? If you don't get bees before June, it's not going to work. You're lucky. Unless you get a big beehive full of honey that's going to go from June to next year. The one that's already established. So you have two things. You have for making honey. A lot of people want the bees for pollination because they got little apple trees, fruit trees, various uh, things they want to pollinate, be natural back to earth and have some bees and then they're lucky to get some honey. Then the, the second category of people are the ones that they don't really want honey. They want to put a beehive out there and just let it do its thing and that's that second category. Just do their thing, maybe watch the bees flying in there, sit in their chair, just reading a book, watching bees flying it out. And that honey, that, that's, that's great. And they'll do okay for a year or two maybe on their own and then they'll be buying more packages make sure to replace them because they're really not managing it. So, let's see here. Let's see one. Let's see. Let me see. Now, now, summer management honey production. Summer management. Add a super for honey storage before it is needed. So, it looks like these are combined. I was just really looking like they separate. So, in a good nectar flow, a strong hive can fill a super in two to three weeks. Wrong. Top supering is typical. Good practice is to seed with frame. First of all, does everybody know what a nectar flow is? Who doesn't know what a nectar flow is? Okay, great. That's why I'm here. So a nectar flow is when all the elements are right. Right now, the maples, I just noticed yesterday, uh, what's today? Tuesday. Tuesday. I'm sorry, Sunday. <laughs> when I was selling my honey, there's a bunch of maple trees, and they're blooming. I see little blooms, and bees love maples. They produce a lot of nectar. They're very sweet. But Sunday was cool. They're not going to be out flying. So you can have a nectar flow, but a ne not a nectar flow the bees can get. So you need to have all the elements in, all the stars got to be in alignment. You got to have flowers, you got to have at least 60 degrees for the bees to get out and fly and get that nectar. So um, what else do you need? What else do you need for a nectar flow? Um, and that's about it, about temperature and the flowers. You can have temperature, and in fact, what will happen in a lot of places, because people always say, I move my bees. I move my bees the second week of July, I go up the Cascade Mountains, 2,000 feet, I get all the high alpine flowers, and I just kill them up there. I primarily in the fireweed, I uh, got a little bit of, uh, as a beekeeper, you learn, you learn the flowers. You learn the flowers. It does no good. I always have people ask me, say, hey, can you move a beehive over to where I live at? And I said, where do you live at? I said, well, I live over in the middle of Gig Harbor. Eh, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, I got gardenias, I got azaleas, I got all kinds of rhododendrons. Well, that's, that sounds beautiful, but my, it's not how my bees at all. They won't touch those flowers. You can have all, I can have all kinds of flowers, and the bees won't necessarily do that. So the other bees might be bumblebees. So I move my bees in the mountains so I can get my nectar flows. And all the elements are all lined up, the temperature and the flowers, and they're all, if I'm lucky, they're all happening at the same time my bees are working. It says here that a good, a strong hive can fill a super in two to three weeks. I've seen it in one week. And I've seen it both in deep box, or I've seen westerns filled. Last year, I had a bumper. Last year was unbelievable. 
uh, first time in 15 years. Um, I had it. This, I was in, everything was just right. There's moisture in the ground. And also, for nectar foam, it had moisture. This time of year, it's okay. Summertime, we get in the mountains, the ground is dry. But it was a nice snowpack. I'm a little concerned this year because it wasn't a good snowpack. So there's not a lot of moisture in the ground. So the flowers, but the flowers photosynthesize. So they get cool, what happens in the mountains, they get cool down at nighttime, a lot of moisture in the air, they'll fall in that moisture. Summer, in the daytime, they get the sun, the sun, the photosynthesis, to convert that uh, moisture and, 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 the, and the sugar, and the bees get that nectar. So I, and, and so the mountains are great in 2000. And down here, typically, it dries up. So a lot of people tell me, I had a beehive, they bloom great. Uh, come June time, they had, they had a box half full of honey, and then now it's August, and they're almost out of months. They're going to start feeding them because it dried up. There was no more nectar flows down there um, that the bees could get and sustain from. But I've seen it in one week, Philip. I've also seen it where a whole summer they didn't fill a box up in two months because it was everything was wrong. The weather, cold, rainy, flowers are bad. Uh, I've been in areas where the flowers. Uh, we always we keep about 50 hives in an apiary in the mountains. Um, I had up there 500 hives years ago, scattered all around, and uh, we never put all of our eggs in one basket. And I see them. We 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 go. We I'm up there at least once a week or more. I run pollen traps, so I collect my pollen traps. But every three days, I pull pollen off my bees. Um, and I've been up there and I've seen the flowers. We were up there one year. The flowers typically the the fire weed grows about this tall. And the one year where the fire is doing great, we go to one of our bee yards, fire is about this tall, it's stunted, it's not blooming, we get looked at it real close, and it's full of worms. And the worms are wiping the fire weed out. We had to move the bee yards, we had to move somewhere else, because they, were, they weren't getting any honey. So warehives are usually bottom super, and the comb is added for a ladder in the added box. That's fantastic. Uh, horizontal top bar hives are expanded by removing, and I, and I honestly can't talk much about where the horizontal top bar hive is spent by moving the honey from bars and putting the empty bar back in. I think Ted is the expert in there. It's kind of not my area. I'm in the Langston hive. So, so it says top super. Okay, so here's a good idea. This is great. I want to talk about this. So top supering is typical. Good practice is saving the frame. And what that means is, so you have a beehive. And your beehive is doing really you get a, You get a package. You put it in your box. They're doing great. They got their wax plants going. They're drawing out cells. Uh, come around June, where you live at, the blackbird is starting to come on strong, the weather's really nice, and you take it, and your two boxes have got them drawn out a lot of cells. This is very important. This is how you how to kind of pop the bees out, So because you, you want some honey. So you've got two deep boxes, they've drawn out the cells, they've got a lot of brood going on, the weather's great, they're bringing a the nectar, they're bringing a the pollen. You're looking down there, you're kind of, you're, you're being a little anxious, you're doing too much work in them. You're looking at your frames and drawing all the cells out to the outside frames. You're starting to put nectar in there, they've got lots of brood. And whoever you talk to, the bee clubs, say, you know what, it's time to put it in the box. And you have boxes already. So you're, you want to use westerns. I like westerns because they're like half the size of a deep, easy to handle, about 60 pounds when they're full of honey. And so you put a western and say, okay, I'm going to put a western. And it's got um, foundation in there, because most all people starting out start with foundation. I use a lot of foundation. I mix it up. Um, so you put a foundation on there, but and in fact is, and go back. You may use a deep on top, because with this top, when it says a seed frame, you're going to go down that, that first top box, the top box of the two, and the outside frame, probably about the third one, you're going to pull that out, it's full of honey. And you're going to take one of this, uh, your third deep box, because you're starting out and you've got to build this stuff up. You're going to take a foundation, put it there, and take that seed frame, that frame that's got that comb honey, that drawn out wax and honey, and you're going to put it right in the center. And move to the side, put it right in the center. That gets the bees to go up there. There's times when you put a box of uh, foundation on top of two good boxes of healthy bees, they won't go up there. They don't want to go up there. There's nothing up there. some old, old wax up there, this foundation. There's nothing up there. And it means it work. But you put a foundation, put a frame of honey up there, they'll go up there and then get that honey, protect the honey, fill the honey, and they start working out. That's a seed frame. But I do it all the time. It's deep. So I, but 
In my case, I used Westerns. Now, all my Westerns, we're going to see a little bit, I use what they call wet boxes. I got boxes that are uh, about as old as me, 15 years old, 29 years old, whatever. I have boxes that I've been using for years, and we call them wet boxes. Last year, I have, in my shop, I have 500 boxes stacked up that were full of honey last year. I extract all the honey. We call that a wet box because it has all the residual of the honey there. I put that box on the bees just go nuts. They get up there, they clean it, they want that, and get right up to that honey and start filling right back up. But mine are all drawn out cells. I'm talking, you guys are all new beekeepers, so you're going to be working on foundation. Foundation, unless you find as you buy boxes that have been drawn out from last year's bees, and maybe somebody's selling some boxes, or some beehives or whatever. But the seed frame is to get bees up into it. A lot of times they're a little hesitant to get into the foundation of work. Yes, sir? So can you start one of your brood uh, boxes with a western foundation so you can move it up to a western? Because you can't move a deep one up into a western. No, you can't. And no, you can't. Yes, you can. It's tricky. Because what will happen is you put a western down there that deep box is, they, they, they're going to make that a deep box. A deep frame, I'm sorry. They will take it and put another layer of room, this here long or comb, on the bottom of that western frame. So you can do that, and they'll fill that thing out, and you pull it out, and you'll pull that thing out, and go, oh my God. And it's just like a deep frame with comb down there. It'll take you, and I'm going to cut that thing off into your Tupperware tub. I, I take, I have uh, tubs I take when I go to all my bee yards, because I pull my lids off. I have all kinds of bridging and comb up there, and I scrape it off in a tub. And every day when I come, when I get out of the bee yard and I go back home, I got a tub full of all kinds of wax comb, and I use it for a novel thing for people to chew on. But the same thing there. You put a, you mix your frames up from a deep to a western. Of course, you can put a deep and a western. You put a western in a deep box, they will draw a comb out of the bottom of it. And it kind of gets messy because a lot of times they'll take that comb and they do bridging. These got to have bridging to walk back and forth. And they'll bridge between that western, they put that comb down there, they'll fill that space full of comb, and they'll bridge over to the next one, the frames next to it. So they go back and forth. When you pull that out of there, oh, it makes a mess. It'll tear in half. You look down, it's full of brood or whatever, and bees, and they get nasty and cranky. And, 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 and it, it, may, it, don't, it can't mix frames. So you can see here is both these slides, and that's what they talk about, being consistent in your bee yard. And starting, what, what, what you can do, oh, it, it's tough. And starting out, when you start with the Western box, you just need to, you, that's where you get into feeding them to manipulate them to get their wax glands going and get that going out. But what you can do when you put your second western on, your first western is going to have some drawn out comb. And then you can use that for a seed frame. If you're like me and you have a bunch of boxes of honey, I use seed frames all the time. Um, I don't use deep frames anymore, deep boxes for my honey, because they're too heavy on they're heavy. And they're not. They're very heavy. And we're going to talk about running my uh, frame. Okay, two story deep over winter hives should be about five stories high by June. I found that very interesting. I get that really, oh, that's where you live in. Um, I don't see that. It says a two story deep. So two stories deep. You've seen the deep here in the last couple of sessions we've had. Should be about five stories high by June. I, I quite honestly, I've never seen that. I've never seen that. Are they talking about super? <coughs> that's a good question. Now, last year, I got some photographs. Last year, I had some beehives that last year, I had such a good year, I had them there this time. But there were two names in all westerns. I had four and five westerns on top of them. Now, what I do, in my case, what I do, and we're going to see this here soon, and probably it's maybe here next one. When I put a new box on, I take my old boxes off and full of honey and put my new box on, and then put my old box on top of that. I didn't use queen excluders. We're going to talk about that here also, I see. Because the queen won't pass that, that, those empty frames. And they have all the whack, and they honey. And the bees don't want to go up there. And they go through that and they'll fill it up. It's just a way to, it's like another way to see, use seed frames. To, kind of, to get the bees encouraged up in there. Um, so I, I honestly, I have never, I did say it. Um, I have a good friend of mine in um, um, Pennsylvania. And they did it there. There they had the golden rod that's about uh, from September, uh, September and October, November. And I've seen him with, um, and they just get, they go gangbusters there. And I've seen it with um, five stories. But again, it's the westerns. 
I don't think it's an eight boxes. Five neat boxes would be that'd be way up there. It'd be hard to it'd be way up there. Yeah, you'd be on a ladder all right, brain job. So a three western brood nest can have seven to eight or eight supers high by June. I, I don't know where that comes from. But that's some um, that's yeah. And even all the books I read in the journals, I, I don't see that very often. Well, every now and then you see somebody that's combined hives and whatever they're building them up. Is there um, a reason why you, you want to do that? Nope. Okay. Well, no. I'm just, let me take that back. Yes, there is. If there was a super nectar flow and they were filling the boxes up every week, because your nectar flow around here, the nectar flow, you're going to have your first nectar flow is in June. The big primary. Around this part of the country, it used to be the huckleberries. I used to move my bees up around the Allen and that, up by uh, Deer Creek, all that area up there. I used to go to Simpson property. I used to get all the spring, I used to get all the uh, huckleberries, put my bees up there until um, um, about June, I'm bringing them back. I did the, then I did a blackberry farm. And um, so, yes, we would do that if you're in a good, <coughs> but we're talking filling a box up in one week. Those nectar flows only last about three or four weeks. So if you get a box in this in one or two weeks, it's only two boxes. I don't know they get five boxes. If you're in a place where you've got several nectar flows, um, and they, I, I, honestly, I have never, and I've been to some tropical areas where they have nectar flows about 90% of the year, and they don't get that out. So what you would do that if the boxes are filling up, and you work in a full box. A lot of times, if, I, if I'm running low on honey in the summertime, I may pull boxes off and take them home and extract them. Around August, if I'm running low on honey, I may pull some boxes off and take my ass and extract them out and ask them on this side. So, um, if you use a queen excluder, place it between the brood boxes and the first honey. Everybody knows what a queen excluder is. Who doesn't know what a queen excluder is? So, it's just a wire, it's a wire cage or wire bar full of wires, and it's too skinny that the queen can't squeeze through it. And it can't, the reason why you use it, I don't use it. Um, I don't worry about a queen going up the top. I don't care if she lays a lot of brood, because I know that she'll quit laying, she'll move back down around August, and I can move my frames around. If I got brood frames up my honey, I got other boxes I can put those in to help build them up, so I can move, I can pull frames up. If I had a couple frames, a lot of people, we have a couple beehives, you might want to use those, because it will keep them going up and laying the um, <coughs> laying room in your honey and supers. But what it also does, I've been told, um, why I don't use them, because it also it can tend to slow bees going into your boxes. Sometimes the bees don't like passing that <coughs> unnatural material. The um, so we got uh, how we're trying to bait the supers so bees will move up and not crown the roof. And we found that's using a bait frame. If you've got a couple beehives, you can pull frames out and put it on top to get the bees. Anytime you got something up on top of the brood chambers with some honey in there, or even brood, you don't encourage the bees to go and take care of them, to move them up, to get and work in that those frames you have a foundation or frames on top of drawing out cells. When any supers are baited above the clinics, the bees usually continue to work through the clinic excluded. Usually. Some beekeepers will create an entrance above the excluder to make it possible the ent for the enter oh, to enter the supers without going through the brood nest. Um, not typically in Washington. I don't know if anybody in Washington does that. Down in areas where it's warmer, they do that. They'll have holes. You'll see the top boxes for bees. But a lot of that's for ventilation also because it gets very, very hot. And that's why typically in um, the southern states, they'll paint their beehives white to reflect the heat. We paint them dark to pull in the control. Sure. I've never had beehives with any interests in top. I call, we call those leakers. Um, a two-story, and I'll get it. We're going to talk about that what, what was said about leakers. So a two-story over winter hive should be about five stories high by two. This is the same one I just did. Yeah, did. Where is it? Back up there? Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Honey is marked in four ways. Oh, hey, listen, there's one test. Four ways. So, comb honey production requires comb honey. Is one. Everybody know what comb honey is? Everybody ate comb honey? Old school comb honey? When I was a little kid, that's something my dad always bought at home. Um, 
So coal mining is, um, and there's what they call, these are called, well, they're, they're also known as Ross Browns. I recommend no one do Ross Browns. I've tried them, I've tried them, I've tried them. They do not work out. Um, but coal money is just that, it's coal money, and you can buy special foundation without the wire that you put in your frame, and it requires, and I, I haven't read this, it says, okay, California production requires special equipment. That's not true. The Ross rounds it does. It's a really funny box. It's got these round plastic things. And, and I have put them on for the last 10 years. I haven't tried those. And the bees don't touch them. They eat them. Huh. But yet I read about people, there's some guys, the Ross rounds, they talk about them. Back east, they were good. They do not work out of them. I have tried them. I have put them on strong hives. I have done everything to get the bees in them. They do not touch them. They'll crawl over them and they poop on them. They don't, they don't want to poop on them. Uh, coal honey production requires special equipment. So the, all you need for coal honey, it's the same as a frame, whether it's a deep or a western. And you can buy in the catalogs, you can buy, or maybe even um, um, oh, um, um, stemmons. You can buy foundation. That does not have wire, it's just wax foundation. And I wire my frames and I melt my wax into the wire. Um, two little strips of wire, my westerns, the wax goes there, and, they, and that wax is a soft wax. And they'll fill that up and they'll make that beautiful. It looks so beautiful. And what I do at the end of the season, that's my comb right there. So that frame, I sell, people will ask for comb honey, I sell the whole frame with that comb honey. Uh, I would last year, 20 bucks a frame. 20 bucks a frame, and nice comb honey. I can take, and a lot of times I'll take the, these here, these squares here, because I'll take a frame, and I can cut out, I'll cut these in half. So I'll take my frame, and I pull, I cut the wire at the end of it, and I just pull the wire all the way out, so now I have just pure wax, and I got a nice comb cat honey, and I cut it out with a knife, and I cut it in cubes and put it in a little tiny, I got a little packaging for it, and people just love it. It's, it's a novelty, it's fun, it's a lot of people like to share with younger people how it was when they saw it there, the grand folks were wearing it. Uh, so it doesn't taste special, but, but it does taste a good nectar pulp. And you can't, you have to do, the cone honey isn't done until it's all capped. It's got to be capped so it doesn't make a mess. Um, said, so, swarming, I said, so, and more intense than that, events swarming because the bees must be quite crowded. And, crowded. and that's true, you have to have them pretty crowded to draw that up. But not, the way I do it, not any more than it was a regular hive of cone. Um, beginners, and I mark, I also mark, on top of all my frames, I write comb on them because they all look alike when they draw them all out. So I write C on them my, to mark my comb, so I know that's comb honey that I'm going to cut up. Um, beginners should not produce, uh, attempt to produce comb honey? Uh, probably not. You get them to pay attention to your bees before you get to that advanced level. Um, the best thing to do is to watch a more experienced beekeeper who produces comb honey. Uh, that's good. Also, a good book to read for more information is the Comb Honey book. Okay. Go. Any questions about Comb Honey? Excellent. Honey is marketed for us in uh, ways of tracking. Most common way of tending honey. So, we're showing all kinds of containers. Um, so, we remove the bees from honey supers, remove honey supers, remove cappings from frames. Uh, heated, and that's supposed to be probably an uncapping knife, um, ten, tangential extractor, out, tangential extractor, radial extractor. Um, I have both those. This is an old, which is an old A roots, which is what I have. Um, place uncapped frame in ten. Everybody, has anybody ever, people familiar with the, the, the uh, cappers, or I'm sorry, the extractors? So I have one of these here. I've got a radio, 72 frame extractor. Um, packaging for your honey is whatever you want to put it in. Um, so I like this here. This really helps out. This makes it a lot easier to remove your bees from the honey. That, that is, that's an important step. Um, I remove my bees, and I do it two ways. So if you don't remove your bees from the honey, it really makes a mess to put them down there those extractors. Please <laughs> don't like that ball. Uh, play some cafe here. All right, honey is marked in four ways again. Finally, crystallized cream. I don't do that. I read about it. 
There's all kinds of creamy tinctures and buying that. But I am going to go back here. Actually, I'm going to move on. Um, I'm going to guess this here is going to talk more about the extract. Because I'll talk more about that. And about removing bees. I say, I'm all about making my hot honey. So bottle the honey, filter the honey, spin out the honey. Let's see what it talks about here. Because I will talk about that. Using this is uh, anybody familiar with cream honey? I see it in the store sometimes, cream honey. And I see it in the menu, you can buy this kit to cream honey. I, I don't need cream honey. Um, I have now, I get honey that turns to sugars, or goes to sugar crystals. And typically, and it's funny about that, because in my honey room, I have a, a lot of shelves, and I have, and I have honey that's marked that. I, have, I also have cabinets of honey uh, that I've been collecting for 25 years from all the world. And uh, some of the honey goes to the crystal, or Russian honey goes to uh, sugar really fast. And I don't know why it does. I was just reading an article about why it goes to sugar. The, um, um, it's the, I don't know, temperature. I have honeys that sometimes at 35 degrees that never go to sugar, and some at 50 degrees go to sugar. The flowers, the type of, and of course there's all different kinds of sugar molecules. Um, maybe there, I was reading an article about the sugar the the, uh, the crystals it starts if there's one crystal that starts in the network then grow. I don't know. I know that it doesn't sell good. Um, so let's see. Cut or cut comb honey. And this is what I do. So this is showing. This is taking a frame of comb honey and they cut it. Then it goes in little. You can buy little containers for it. Comb honey. And some people like that. I sell. And I used to do this here. This here is actually taking jars of honey and putting the comb in a jar of honey. Another novelty, guys. Um, I think I had, in all my years of selling honey, I had one person bring back a jar of honey that was bad. I remember this. I was a young lady. And uh, a long time ago, and I, I said, I'm sorry. What was wrong? It, it was all, it was, it was something inside of me. It was cold honey. I didn't say, no, it's fine. Okay. Of course, half the jar was gone, the honey. In the new jar. I took that in jar, fed it back to the bees. Uh, I just get it right in summertime, I can feed bees right, feed them their honey back. You know, put it right back and clean it all up for me. And I'll sell it back to someone else. Someone else. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, that's the only jar I got. So, chunk honey is cut comb, placed in a container, filled with extracted honey. And that's what this is right here, basically. A comb in there with some extracted honey. Same thing here, there's a comb right here. There's a couple combs down there. You see that lot back east? When I try back east. Back east, they got some, and they do a lot of comb honey. More than out here, that I'm familiar with. Uh, obviously, you cannot use plastic foundation when making comb honey. You can, but it's a little chewy. Uh, <laughs> jump and cut comb honey. You need thin, special foundation, and I'm missing the last line. Um, and that's us about buying special foundation. And it just doesn't have the wire, and it's a little bit thinner wax. So it's when it's easy to chew. Of course, found it, the comb is just like chewing. I mean, I get tons of comb up in the mountains. When I'm doing honey, I'm scraping off my bee box and that, and I'm tasting all my honey, chewing the comb up. And when you have your wires and your frames, they go across this way? Yes, sir. This well, way? my frames go right. this way. Right. When you buy my, my foundation that I buy, have wires that go this way. And then my frames on the top bar and the bottom bar have a group. So that when I can snap that foundation in there, those wires will snap in those grooves. And then I can melt that transformer that I touch the ends of my wire, that I push against, I have a board laid up here, that I put down the foundation against that board, pushes against the wires, and I touch the ends of the wires, and it melts some wires in the foundation. So it holds a rigid. If you don't do that, when you're trapped and carrying that stuff, that foundation will break out and fall apart. It gets pretty, the foundation is pretty brittle. Um, like days like today, it gets cold and it gets a little bit brittle. Um, and as you get up there, if you break your foundation, you open a box of them, it's all lying in the bottom. And it makes it tough for me to draw it out. Um, so let's see what else we got here. Important, most medications are only allowed to be applied while there are no honey supers on the hive. Do not contaminate your honey. Um, that's very important. For top bar hives, there is typically no delineation between root chambers and honey chambers, so most medications are not used in top bar hives. Um, I don't use, I do not use medications um, when during a honey flow or when my when my honey boxes are. I don't use. I don't 
It's not going to any good. I wait for my, well, and there's the, they get the foam management. So when I pull, I pull my honey boxes off. All my honey boxes come off about, uh, I start pulling them off the um, last week, second, the third, and fourth week of August every year. All my honey comes off. Um, and I move all my honey frames around. There's some honey boxes got through. One goes in other boxes. I move them all around. I do take, you were asking about putting a western down to have it drawn out. What I will do, I might find a western that's got a frame full of brew. I'll, put, I'll pull a frame, a nice frame with drawn out meat box of comb. I'll put that western down in there. I'll let that root hatch out. Because I know that after September, that'll be all hatched out. They'll, be full, they'll fill a full of honey. And I'll put it, I'll put it, I'll go take my meat frame, extract it, bring it back up and switch them out in a week or two. And that'll be drawn out full, that'll be all capped with honey with root milk going on. I'll put western back out, put a meat frame back in there. Uh, but I have all my honey off by September. The month of September is the time for the bees to get all their honey away. Because I always have my last nectar flow in the month of September in the mountains. I have uh, pearly everlasting. I got uh, uh, there'll be a golden rod. I'll get some of some blackberries up there, and there's a lot of clover running. And the bees will be packing away. So September, all of them they'll be down to two boxes, and they got to fill it up for them. I when I take all my honey home and extract it. I always have, and you're probably going to see it soon here, I always have a lot of frames that aren't kept. I don't extract them. We're going to, you're going to see it here as we talk about fermentation, about fermenting honey. If it's not, we call that, if the honey has not worked, um, it's a term I've been using, I've heard from my vendors from, for years and years. If the honey is not completely worked, which means if it's, when it's worked, it's kept. That means that the water's taken out of it, because it comes up with flowers, it's got a lot of water in there. The bees work it, take the water out of it, it's down, and this is maybe an exam, 18 or less percent moisture. And that honey, if it's not, if it's higher than that, it will ferment. That's how the Vikings discovered meat. So they fermented. Made that nice flexion. So we got remove the honey from your hives because you need to leave enough honey for the bees to make it more water. I don't worry about that when I pull my honey up because I have enough hives. When I pull my honey up, I get down and I'm extracting it. The frames that aren't drawn out, and I will do that for winter time. I will put western <coughs> in deep boxes to get my bees in the winter because they're not going to draw. Their, their wax pans aren't going to They're not going to draw that out anymore. They're not going to add any comb on there, but they got honey there. So I like to have all my beehives. I like all my beehives to have. Uh, to, I like I like 70 pounds of honey. My beehives get the winter out here. Especially in a wild winter like this. The bees have been very active. They've probably been eating a lot more honey than they did last year. They're a lot more active. They're moving around a lot more. They need more food. I don't like to feed my bees because I honestly believe for the years I've spent, I fed my bees thousands of gallons of feed, but I find that I think bees do much better on their honey than they do the feed. I do feed them and to manipulate my bees to get my queen laid eggs. Yes? Okay. The 70 pounds of honey, is that per colony? Or for, or for all of your colonies? Is that the 70 pounds of honey? Per colony. Per colony. I like 70 pounds of honey per colony. Which typically, at the end of September, my bees will have probably about five or six frames of that meat box full of honey to catch. And maybe a couple in the bottom. Right now, all my hives have 50 plus, because I had 70 plus by the end of last year, September. Right now, my beehives have, well, I just felt they're, they're heavy. They got 40 pounds of honey. I've got four or five, five frames of cat honey in my top boxes still. You had a question? Okay, so when you're going to extract your honey and if your frame is not fully capped, uh, you're not going to extract as you, as you were saying. Um, is that 100% capped or maybe just a few of them? Or? That's a great question. Three quarters percent. Three quarters. Of them. Okay. And I just framed that. But I've always done it. Now, most times, I sell my honey pretty fast. Yeah. Um, typically, I, I every now and then I get, but I always want to make sure I have reserve for my bees. Mm -hmm. So I'm not too greedy. Right. I don't think he was um, But if I have a frame that has, um, though typically the whole frame will be full of honey, capped honey, and the center where the brood was a week before, they didn't, they got some nectar there, but the brood's gone, it's nectar. 
and it's not capped, just a little towards the center, oh, it's short. But I, I always make sure, I pay attention to what I have reserved, but I always want to make sure I've got, I have a half a dozen boxes right now that are full of last year's money that I'll be putting on my music. It can be for a minute. Some of them might, and some they might shiver a little bit in the hive. They'll, they'll take it, they'll clean it up, but it's still count. Follow on question. Mm -hmm. So, you take your honey around August or end of August, give the bees September to make their own honey. Correct. When do you start feeding them for the winter or during the I don't. Yeah. I don't. You know, they have enough their own honey. I do feed my bees. I will start feeding my bees here in the next week or two. But I feed them the, I don't feed them the, because they're hungry. I feed them to get the queen to lay eggs so that she can build that population when the next one's coming up. So there are people that feed me. There are, and there are, there are beekeepers. I know lots of people that are kind of greedy. They find they can make a lot more money on their honey and it's cheaper to feed the bees. So they'll pull all their honey up. How are we doing? Okay, I got the, I got the, I got the red light up. Okay, so here's a feed of white sugar liquid. Yeah, yeah. And is that it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my good time. Yeah, sugar. I feed them sugar. Um, I used to down in when I was calling in California. I used to do we used to do these three and tainted cars of corn syrup. There's a lot of discussion about corn syrup and that. I feed my bees some. I buy my sugar. I used to have a big sugar contract with a big, uh, big baking company up in Seattle. I get all kinds of sweeteners up there. Um, I get my sugar now by the Costco. I mix it up. I like mixing it about 50-50. <coughs> I'll take a four gallon bucket. I mix my. I have actually. I actually have an old Ain Roots. It's 100 years old extractor. That was my four frame double sided. I started out with. It's my sugar mixture. I pour sugar and hot water in there. That thing turns. Mix it up my sugar more. And I like go 50, 50 I will start feeding my beans here in the next week or two. Not for feeding, but I, I like having only. But if you don't have their own honey, you do have to feed them, and um, they will take the feed and survive. Yes, sir. So by feeding them sugar water, that somehow stimulates the clean. It sure does. That's hands. another class. <laughs> uh, it's all about clean manipulation. There's there's several things that queen looks at. The queen lays her eggs based on weather, nectar format. When it's, when it's cold enough like today, you feed her, she thinks there's nectar coming in. She's laying eggs like crazy. <laughs> so you ever try to feed the soda, see what happens? All right, we're going to take a five-minute break. <laughs> I'm cut off. So we're going to reconvene at 